Can you tell us what you remember about the battle? We'd been fighting for a while. On the seventh day, we ran out of ammo. We had to scavenge all we could from the weapons that had been left behind. The pistols, shotgun rounds, a handful of grenades. Do you remember where you were? When Master Chief armed his grenade, I was in the back of an overturned warthog firing an M41. How did you manage to keep it together? We knew Master Chief was still in the fight. He gave us hope. 2007 is often cited as one of the best years for video games, and with titles like Super Mario Galaxy, Bioshock, and The Orange Box, it's hard to disagree with that claim. But even among these greats, only one game managed to become something that felt much larger than a video game. One that not only encouraged playing with others, but extended a hand beyond the gaming community, beautifully illustrating why so many people could be so emotionally invested in a video game. One that made everyone believe. Of course, I'm talking about Halo 3. Hello, and thanks for joining me for the third and final video in my series on the original Halo trilogy. If you're new to my channel, I do recommend watching at least the Halo 2 video before this one, but with that out of the way, let's finish this G-dang fight. Unlike the development of Halo 2, Bungie knew right from the start that a Halo 3 would definitely be in the works, and while part of the team would continue to work on content for Halo 2 in the months surrounding its launch, the rest of the studio immediately began laying the foundation for Halo 3's story and design. With Halo 2's ball-busting cliffhanger of an ending, it was clear that the studio not only needed to deliver an epic conclusion to the series' story, but they also had to create a much more detailed game on Microsoft's new HD console. The new console meant new possibilities for Bungie, but it also meant that a lot of work would need to be done to make any Halo 2 assets not look like complete dog ass in HD. After working hard on the project for two years, Bungie finally unveiled the first cinematic trailer for Halo 3 at E3 of 2006. The trailer had gotten the Halo hype train chugging away at full steam, and with a year left before launch, Microsoft aimed to capitalize on that hype as much as possible. After the massive success of Halo 2, Microsoft knew that Halo 3 had a shit ton of potential, and with an advertising campaign costing more than $40 million, Microsoft's primary goal was to not only excite and appeal to the more hardcore Halo fans, but to capture the attention of the casual audience as well. They wanted the Halo 3 launch to be a gigantic event, one that was not only covered by gaming publications, but the mainstream media as well. The advertising campaign began with a TV spot entitled Starry Night that aired on December 4th, 2006 during a Monday night football game. Being a mix of live action and CGI, this ad didn't directly show any gameplay footage, but it did introduce aspects of the game such as the bubble shield and the return of the assault rifle. This ad was followed up by a public beta test of Halo 3's multiplayer, which was accessed by either visiting the Halo 3 website following the Starry Night ad and signing up for a code, or buying certain copies of the game Crackdown that had promised access to the beta. The beta test featured the maps Valhalla, High Ground, and Snowbound, and also featured an early version of the Save Films feature, but I'm going to talk about that later. At E3 of 2007, Bungie followed up the beta test with a new trailer, one that contained cinematics as well as gameplay, along with a live-action short titled Arms Race. The short was directed by Neil Blomkamp and was Halo's first foray into a live-action setting. Arms Race was the first in a trilogy of live-action shorts, which together created Halo Landfall. The compilation served as a prequel to Halo 3, tying the events of the battle to Master Chief's arrival, and with the third short airing on Discovery Channel's website, the films aimed to introduce new viewers to the conflict of Halo 3, while also making the Halo universe feel a bit closer to home. Now, other than the mass amount of promotional tie-ins with shit like Mountain Dew Game Fuel, the final piece of Microsoft's ad campaign was a series of spots all ending with the tagline, Believe. But before I talk about the Believe ads, I first have to admit that if I seem overly excited or biased, it's because I think these are the best advertisements for a video game, like, ever. 
Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of other great contenders, but for me, without a doubt, these are, like, my absolute favorite. The Believe ads all center around the fictional Museum of Humanity, featuring documentary-style interviews with surviving members of the battles that take place in Halo 3. The museum features relics of the Covenant War that players have fought in throughout the entire Halo trilogy, but the relics also cleverly give a glimpse of what's to come in Halo 3, such as the addition of the Brute Spiker weapon. The interviews with the fictional veterans feel genuinely emotional and personal, and they all revolve around John 117, the Master Chief, you know, the guy you get to play as. It's a super unique approach to get someone to buy a video game where no gameplay is shown but instead you get an emotional depth that is rarely seen in an advertisement, let alone one for a video game. The series of ads culminates with footage of the diorama that's on display inside the Museum of Humanity, featuring an insanely detailed, handcrafted battle between the humans and the Covenant. With Chopin's Raindrop Prelude number 15 playing in the background, there's something about it being a diorama and not CGI or live action that somehow ends up making the ad feel much more real and personal and never fails to give me the goosebumps. Uh, right, uh, sorry, just, uh, let me recover from that emotional roller coaster real quick. Um, okay, uh, Halo 3 launched on September 25th, 2007, making $170 million in the first 24 hours in the U.S. alone, and would end up selling over 8 million copies worldwide by the end of the year. So, uh, it... It did alright. Halo 3's gameplay is very much just an extension of Halo 2's, with some slight changes and additions. Dual wielding stuck around this time, with the addition of more one-handed weapons such as the Spikers and Maulers. The assault rifle from Halo 1 returned, the Needler was no longer dual wieldable, thank god, new power weapons were added such as the Gravity Hammer and Spartan Laser, turrets can be ripped off and carried around temporarily making you feel as badass as possible, awesome new vehicles like the Mongoose and Chopper were added, deployable items like the Bubble Shield and Healing Gas and Electro Orb were introduced, and the Battle Rifle is still the king. Long live the kit. Even disregarding its massive arsenal and features, Halo 3 just feels super good to play. All the guns look and act exactly how you'd expect them to, and the sound design is just... Mm. It, it, it is heaven. For the record, I do think Halo 3's gameplay is the peak of the entire Halo series, but I mean, that that's just my opinion. If you, if you like the battle rifle in Halo Wars better, then dog bless. Although I mainly want to discuss the brilliant multiplayer of Halo 3, I do briefly want to say a couple things regarding the campaign. The campaign of Halo 3 seems to be a bit polarizing among fans of the series, with some loving the epic set pieces and variety of locations, and others disliking it for feeling too short and underdeveloped on the story side of things. Personally, I, I'm a big fan of Halo 3's campaign, but not, not just for the well-paced action and variety of areas, but for its art design. Ten years later, this is still the prettiest Halo game to me, and although the later titles technically have much more detail and polish and textures and shit, there is a very warm and inviting quality of Halo 3's visual design that I, I am just in love with. Even though the game renders at 1152 by 640 and is locked at 30 FPS, the payoff is the beautiful usage of high dynamic range lighting in environments that brilliantly use color and style to hide the limitations of the hardware. Whether it's the ancient Forerunner architecture set against the wilderness, or the bold use of color on multiplayer maps like Guardian or The Pit, Halo 3 is a visual treat. However, Halo 3's biggest accomplishment wasn't the campaign or even the art design. The real beauty of Halo 3 is its ability to connect players in a ridiculous amount of ways for a ridiculous amount of fun. 
Not only could the campaign be completed with four players now instead of two, but the excellent multiplayer from Halo 2 was expanded on in almost every way possible. The multiplayer matchmaking on Xbox Live had been refined, giving players a wealth of playlists to choose from, ranked, or social. On the social side, you got modes like the free-for-all rumble pit, team-based social slayer, and the wacky-ass action sack. But on the rank side, you got the big boy shit like SWAT and Team Snipers, as well as an official MLG playlist with the same settings and map rotation from the then successful MLG Pro League for competitive Halo 3. And among all of this, four player split screen was possible during matchmaking with guest accounts in the social playlist or with additional Xbox Live accounts signed in on the ranked playlist. This wealth of options was topped off with an easy to use interface where every player logged on can open up their own unique settings menu to change their controls or the appearance of their character. This time, offering selections for not only the color of their emblem and character, but for individual armor pieces as well. So the Xbox Live matchmaking offered a large amount of features and flexibility, but perhaps you noticed earlier how the main menu said custom games instead of split screen. Halo 3's wealth of multiplayer options contained all the stuff you'd expect, like changing the weapon set on map or basic player traits, but also wacky shit like advanced respawn settings and custom power-ups. The immense variety of game variants was only further expanded on by map variants, which were introduced with Halo 3's Forge mode. To this day, Forge mode blows my mind. Basically, Bungie had already designed these beautiful and interesting maps, but then in Halo 3, they gave us the tools to not only drastically alter their maps, but to practically make entirely new ones as long as it fit within a map's asset budget. You could edit weapon placements, vehicle placements, item placements, spawn placements. Don't like something? Change it. Want to build a big old ramp for your racetrack? Do it. With Forge, Bungie not only gave players the tools to change how a Halo game plays, but they let you essentially create new games within the sandbox that game variants and map variants had to offer. This allowed for community creations like Rooster Teeth's now famous Griff Ball, which would eventually make it onto Xbox Live matchmaking as its own playlist. Oh yeah, and you can do all of this in four player split screen. I have so many fond memories of playing Forge at my friend's house, constantly trying to drop tanks on each other while creating the craziest shit we could think of. And whenever anything amazing would happen in these multiplayer matches, Bungie had blessed us with a time machine to relive these moments, also known as the theater mode. Along with Forge, theater mode is a console innovation that still amazes me. Basically, Halo 3 would save data from every recent multiplayer match you've played, and then allow you to relive and watch those moments again in real time as the game engine read the data to recreate everything that happened down to the most precise detail. This means that it's not just captured footage of what you saw during a match, but instead a recreation of the entire match, allowing you to fly around and view any moment from any angle even slowed down to a frame by frame speed. This meant you could retrace your actions to see exactly how events played out, or to see exactly how you got 360 no scoped by an 11 year old child. Theater mode also allowed capturing screenshots, and matches could even be viewed with up to four players in an online party. The neatest part of theater mode was that if your friend claimed he got a kill apocalypse with a single magnum on Guardian, well, now he had the evidence to prove it. The icing on the cake of Halo 3's multiplayer features, and the thing that really ties it all together though, is the file share. Not only did Bungie give players the tools to play, create, and relive amazing moments, but they also encouraged sharing all of that with others. As long as the Xbox had a hard drive, the file share allowed any Xbox Live account to upload game variants, map variants, saved films, and screenshots to their file share to then be accessed and downloaded by others. And if the gamer tag was linked on Bungie.net, all of that content from a file share could be exchanged between accounts on the website as well. With all of these features, Halo 3 was the perfect complement to a console made for an age of online interactivity with others. And because every 360 came with a headset, meeting new people and constantly being invited to custom games was a regular thing, for better or worse. It's funny to me, and also a little sad, how a game from 10 years ago can still go toe to toe with modern multiplayer console games in terms of features and capabilities. In most cases, 
I'd actually say it's still not even much of a competition. Halo 3 is a game that is so much more than a sum of its parts. It is what everything Halo represents to fans of the series. Although Reach would expand on some of 3's features like an improved Forge mode, it really didn't necessarily need to and there's a reason why every game after 3 slowly brought up a divide between Halo fans. In a way, it's kind of hard to be mad at Bungie or 343 for not delivering a game better than Halo 3 because there's not a whole lot of directions to go in that can undoubtedly be better than the rich experience Halo 3 delivers. It's definitely not perfect in every single tiny way, but when I think about what a Halo game means to me in terms of gameplay, art, multiplayer, and just the pure video game bliss of getting together with friends to play a game that encourages interacting and bonding with others, there is no better title in this series to represent Halo than Halo 3. Well, kids, I, I think I think that's everything. Um, thank you so much for watching this video. If you've been around since the first Halo video, uh, dog bless you. Thanks for sticking around. Um, that's going to be it for these Halo videos for now. I might return to the series at a later date and discuss Reach and what 343 has done with the series. But uh, in the meantime, you can expect a lot of other shit coming at your way. Uh, with probably a video about title screens, like I had mentioned in the Halo 2 video. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.